have you ever thought about, uh, you know, when you pee on the grass and the, and the grass kind of grows, you know? So <laughs> peeing in your toilet and possibly two months down the line, your, uh, your built-in bra has just grown itself. So that is what Dr. Dylan Randall is doing. <laughs> Grant here with Bird and Bulls. Now, we are at UCT, which is the University of Cape Town in Cape Town, if you didn't guess that. And uh, we are here today with uh, Dr. Dylan Randall, which is, that's correct, your PhD in chemical engineering? Correct. Okay, <laughs> just got to get this right. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's allowed us into his lab to talk about bio bricks, basically. So, uh, literally growing bricks from urine? Yep. Yeah? Okay, Pretty much. Cool. <laughs> So hopefully it's going to be interesting. I'm sure it will be. Um, and if any of you are interested in the environment and protecting the environment, stick around because we're going to talk about that. So, Dylan, thanks very much for having me. And sure. uh, yeah, man, the biobricks. Uh, before we get onto that, um, as we said, you've, you've, you've got your doctorate here, and you are full-time lecturer at the university. Yep. Okay. And then your your main focus is biobricks. Is that? Is that correct? So the main focus in terms of my research is actually resource recovery from wastewater. So that's the broad field. Okay. So always thinking about what kind of resources or value can we obtain from wastewater. Sure. And, and trying to get the most efficiency exactly. out of it. Yes. Okay. And that's, that's kind of what you're aiming for with, with this biobrick thing to eliminate the, the entire waste process. Yeah. Waste process. Or, or another way to look at it is how can we rethink rethink waste streams. So if we take something as simple as urine, what kind of things can we potentially make from it? Okay. And then always asking ourselves, you know, how far can we push the boundaries? Sure. So when we've made something, what next can we make from it? <laughs> okay. No. Well, okay, yeah. that's, that does sound promising. We all, before we move on, I almost forgot, you've, got a, you've won a couple of like, global <laughs> awards, right? <laughs> Like, I saw first place in, in, I can't remember what it was, but some global award and like a second place in something else. Yeah, yeah. Tell us just like your, your recent most biggest ones. What yeah, so I think, I think probably the two most recent ones are the Warner Prize, which is awarded by the Institute of Chemical Engineers okay. for researchers under the age of 40 that are basically pushing the boundaries in terms of sustainability. So this award was given to the work that we're doing with our urine recycling project. And then the other one is, I guess, the FLAIR Fellowship. So FLAIR stands for Future Leaders African Independent Researcher Fellowship, or FLAIR for short. That's a mouthful. And so <laughs> these are quite lucrative fellowships. It amounts to about 300,000 um, pounds for a two-year period. Okay. And the focus of this fellowship is actually on the upcycling of urine. And so, that, that money that you're talking about now, that helps fund what's happening? Yeah, so pretty much everything we have here in terms of the urine recycling is as a result of that kind of funding. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that, that's actually quite nice. So, well, well done on the awards. Um, Thank you. Global <laughs> superstar right here. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, by the way, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't just like ring up Dylan. <laughs> well, I actually kind of did because we went to school together. Now he's got more degrees than a thermometer. Uh, I've got like absolutely not much more than. Oh please! Than one degree. <laughs> uh, we went to school together many years ago. Probably seventeen odd years was yeah. the last time we saw each other. Yeah. And um, yeah, we just decided to get together and just share what's happening. So that's yeah, the thanks, background. Thanks for making the contact. Oh, thank you for inviting us. Um, so. Yeah, just a simple question. Biobricks, why? Yep. Uh, what are biobricks and why? What? So, sure. Um, so, it started off as curiosity. I knew about Biomason, which is a US based company that are essentially growing biomaterials or biobricks. Okay. And they use uh, synthetic urea. So, synthetic urea is actually made through the Haber Bosch process. And that process is the the reason we have such a substantial increase in the population growth because that we, it essentially makes synthetic fertilizers. Okay, yeah. But it's responsible for about 1.2% of our global energy, or it uses about 1.2%. So I wondered if we could use the urea that's typically found in urine 
as a supplement to create a more sustainable process rather than using this energy intensive process. Sure, that's so, a synthetic process by it, making the synthetic urea. Urea, correct. And so that's how the project started. And working in the urine field of all things, I knew that urine has lots of urea. And in 2016, we actually developed a process while I was based in Switzerland to keep all the urea in solution. And this is the key because typically what would happen with fresh urine is that the urea would degrade. As quick as say 48 hours, most of urea has been lost and it gets converted into carbonate ions and ammonium. And so we developed this process where we could actually keep the urea in solution. And that was the key. If we didn't develop that process, we wouldn't actually be able to make biobricks using urine. Okay, and that was, that's actually something that we're gonna pick up later on by yes. this process that you developed. It, it takes away the smell of urine. Correct. So for those of you who are thinking about, uh, <laughs> you know, bricks, urine, uh, is my house gonna smell like, like we? <laughs> Uh, no, it's not. We'll get to that later, but that process yeah. kind of stopped that. Okay. So yeah, so then we applied for funding, so some seed funding, and we first tested it as a concept using synthetic urine, simply because we weren't able to collect the quantities of urine we required. Sure. Because okay. it wasn't so easy at that stage. And then we were in the peak of the drought period in Cape Town, and I proposed to one of the students, I wanted to know if we could collect urine, produce fertilizer, while also treating it so that it could potentially be used for this kind of process. And as a result of that work, oh, and it also shouldn't use any water. So as a result- That was gonna be a question, wasn't yeah. it? Okay, cool. So, okay, sorry, <laughs> so as on. a result of that work, we developed a fertilizer producing urinal. So like the name suggests, it's essentially a urinal yes. that is able to produce fertilizer. But the, the fantastic thing about it is it uses no water. So literally you would pee into a urinal and it would produce the fertilizer and then the liquid component is something that we could use in the biobrick process. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, it's, it's actually, I think it's, it's not a simple process, but overall it is quite a simple process yeah. where... So I think, yeah, you, you spot on. I think when you understand the process, the actual operation of it is quite simple. But for us to get to that stage L was a long, numbers. complex process. Okay. Yeah. I uh, thought I would interrupt the video here just to reiterate what Dylan was saying about the long and complex process. He's been working on this urine research since 2015. It's now 2019, so that's four years already in the making. Uh, quite a lot of research has gone in so far. He's not doing it by himself. Uh, there's a lot of other effort from and input from a lot of other people. And specifically with the Biobricks, he's been uh, doing that since 2017. So that is two years in the making. So just take a moment to appreciate the effort that is going into uh, this waste recovery research. Okay, uh, back to the advantages of the research. So in addition, if you look at conventional bricks that are made in a kiln, it's often at about 1,400 degrees Celsius. So it's really energy intensive and the actual brick making process produces large quantities of CO2. So in essence, it's not a sustainable process, but we rely on the brick making for so many things that we do. And so the beauty about this bio brick process is essentially it uses CO2 indirectly to make carbonate ions, which then is used to make the bio brick. And it also- Without any heat. Without, without any, any heat, heat. Okay. exactly. So it happens at room temperature. Okay. And so you forget about the 1,400 degrees, this is happening without any heat. Sure. So that's also like electrically sustainable. I mean, you're not burning exactly. anything, yeah. you're using electricity to heat So the only, elements. for example, the only power consumption we will require is the power to uh, pump the solution through the mold, essentially. Which is just an electric pump. Well, it's, on scale, it's gonna be yeah. huge electric pumps. Yeah, yeah. But but still less than what you would have for well, film especially fire. heating elements. Like kilns are normally electrically heated, right? Well, Correct. I would imagine commercial. Yeah, they're not they're not burning fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a kiln. Exactly. So. so, so in essence, yeah, you have that that huge benefit, and then we're also recycling multiple waste streams. So you're recycling the urine and making something valuable from it, and then you potentially have the opportunity to recycle different aggregates, so different waste material to essentially be combined together to form a brick. Okay. 
That's, yeah. So overall, it's a win for well, a win for us, and a win mostly for the environment, right? That's well, that yes, that would be the aim. <laughs> yeah. A win for the environment is a win for us. <laughs> you know, in any term, short term, long term, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, the process of, uh, you know, I, was in, I, I did a bit of research, by the way. Well, research is in, like, I watched one of these previous YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sum total of the research. <laughs> um, but it's quite simple, uh, as in we were talking earlier, uh, to produce a brick, you, you're basically using sand or an aggregate. Yes. And you're adding in, uh, you need a bonding agent, and you guys have created the bonding agent. Correct. Which is, which is urea. Yes. And then you need, uh, what, calcium... Something? So any sort of calcium. So fortunately, the urine has calcium in it, okay. and the treatment process adds additional calcium, but we still don't have enough calcium, so we add even more. And that's the um, calcium carbonate, is that? No, or? so we add it as calcium chloride. Okay. The calcium carbonate is actually the cement, the binding the material, binding agent. yeah, okay. binding sure. agent. And that is, isn't that similar to um, your, what your shells and reefs and, Correct. and uh, the Kango Caves, if you've ever been to South Africa? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar to that. Same, same pump out, okay. we're just using it in a different context. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, very, very simple process overall to make these things. Uh, not quite as simple as just peeing in your, <laughs> your toilet and all of a sudden your built-in bra is going to grow. But, uh, or barbecue if you're in America. <laughs> but, but simple overall. Yes, yeah. yes. Another two quick things that I just wanted to touch on. Uh, if you were wondering, there is quite a lot of background noise and that is because there are other experiments happening in the lab and specifically right behind us there was an experiment happening and there were very clear signs that said do not touch, do not turn off. Experiment is very sensitive. So we had to live with the noise. <laughs> the second thing is the audio dropouts. Now I'm sure you've uh, heard these already. Uh, we are using the latest wireless systems bar insert name here a well-respected australian brand and specifically for this system i cannot recommend it for anybody to use uh, it's not very good okay let's get back to the process uh, from start to finish of making these actual bio bricks this whole process the bio bricks making it from start to finish yeah how does it work i mean well it actually starts with the urine collection and that happens in the fertilizer producing urinal that I told you about. Yes, so yes. let me actually first show you that. Okay, let's, let's kind of look. <laughs> so this is actually how we collect the urine. It's a container that we dose with calcium hydroxide. Okay. And then this is obviously the funnel to funnel the urine into the container. And the purpose of the calcium hydroxide is really to, we call, stabilize the urine. So it essentially treats the urine. But like I said, it prevents the urea from degrading, which is sure. what we want so that we can use it later. Now, from what I believe, this, that, that, that calcium is a, is a powdered? Yes, so the calcium hydroxide is a powder that you, you would essentially... So this is the beauty about the process, is the simplicity, is that you pre-dose the empty container with 10 grams per litre so 10 grams calcium hydroxide per liter of urine that you want to collect. Okay. Okay. And this container is 25 liters. So you would add 250 grams of calcium hydroxide a as a powder. Sure. Yeah. That, that's minimal. So yeah. you dose it to the empty container and it acts as a passive dosing system, meaning you don't need any sophisticated dosing pumps and things like that. Sure. So you've got the calcium hydroxide powder in an empty container and then I come along and I pee. Yes. And a small amount of the calcium hydroxide will dissolve. But not and all of it, just a small not, amount. Exactly. So okay. it all depends, hence the passive dosing. Yes. Then you come along and you pee. A little more dissolves. And then obviously the volume fills up. But you've added enough for a whole 25 liters. Yes. So once it's full, so it once it's it's full you find the pH of the solution then increases dramatically to about 12 and a half, okay. which is what we want because it's actually the pH that prevents the urea from degrading okay. and eventually then you essentially have treated the urine yes. on site within the urinal and the other beauty about it is that you make the calcium phosphate so the calcium phosphate would precipitate and go to the bottom of the reactor and as you can see it doesn't have to be connected to a sewage line so that's one of the challenges with urine collection if, if you have a existing building how do separate. you collect the urine in an efficient way? You have to retrofit the plumbing system, yes. you have to change all the pipes, 
and that's expensive. But something like this, if we develop the next version of it, the yes, it could be a freestanding kiosk. Exactly. Okay. So the urinal would look like any other, but it's not connected to sewage line. Yes. And it also you don't have to use any water for it. Okay. Yeah. So some of you might be thinking, well, uh, does it smell? You know, it's, it's open. It's got no gooseneck in it. It's got no anything. And uh, you know, there's a fair amount of urine in that thing. And there's mm. absolutely, I can't smell anything here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so it's, it's the high pH that has actually prevented that. stabilizes that, that urine. Yeah. 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 So really not a problem to... Yeah to keep 30 or 20 liters of it at Yeah, a time. and then essentially once it's full, we then transport it to the lab, which acts as our resource recovery facility. So that's where we recover the value from it. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, let's go and have a look at the bricks. Sure. Sure, after you. <laughs> I mean, you really got to make that thing a little bit better looking, right? Like, uh, yeah, for sure. People are not really just going to have that random bottle in the exactly so, in their office. I mean, maybe in your house, but not yeah. In your so, office. so in essence, that's the first prototype. You know, we we have to make a newer version of it, and it has to look because, in my opinion, this the version that we have now isn't sexy enough. It doesn't look like a conventional urinal. Well, it doesn't um, look like really anything, <laughs> but it does the job. So, so. Yeah. In essence, going forward, and this is actually part of the Flair Fellowship that we have, is to develop that further. Okay. So imagine a urinal that looks like any normal ceramic urinal. It is not connected to a sewer line. It is waterless. And the user doesn't know what's actually happening internally. Sure. And the user comes and they essentially donate their urine. And eventually the container in the actual urinal starts filling up with urine while also producing a fertilizer. And then we alerted that this urinal is near full and it needs to be collected. And so the idea is then that you would go, you would collect the, empty, uh, the full urine container, you would store it until you have enough, and then you transport it to a central location where you recover all the resources. Sure. So imagine a mall or an airport or even the university yeah, sure, yeah. that has these urinals installed all over and you have these transportation logistics determining the, the best route to follow. All the urinals get transported to a central location where you essentially start developing all these other products. I take it they're going to be, or the containers will need to be a little bit bigger than 25 liters, right? Well, <laughs> so, so we thought about that. The idea we want is that each urinal has to be easy to fit within the urinal, so it must take up the same space. So that's why we settled with 25 liters. Okay. And then also it should be easy to carry. So generally 25 liters is yes. probably the easiest amount or volume for someone to carry. And the beauty about treating the urine with the calcium hydroxide is actually it can be stored indefinitely without any urea loss meaning that yeah. we can store it until we need it for alternative products that we want to make. Well, that, that's actually quite neat that it's not that you'll have a shortage. Once you've built up a stock, exactly. you've got the stock. And the stock oh. can sit at the location. So imagine the mall has a stock of all the treated urine just waiting to be collected. Or you can store it at your location where you've already transported it to. But I mean, this is all conceptual. This is part of the yes. project. We have to actually start first First part is to develop the next prototype of the urinal, then test that, then start implementing it, small scale, and then grow it from there. Okay, yeah. I, look, overall I see, uh, as people are lazy creatures, so it must be convenient, yeah. and it mustn't, well, obviously not inconvenience them, it must be convenient, and it mustn't be different, too, too different to the norm. Correct. So to get everybody on board, if I'm thinking correctly, as you say, they. They must just walk up and use it as they would normally do. Exactly. And, and what then, happens in the background? They're none the wiser. That's they, it. They, and so this is the other reason why we're targeting men at the moment. Not to say that we can't collect urine from females because they are unisex urinals. Yes. However, the social acceptance of that, to change the bathroom routine of a female participant in this kind of work, is far more challenging than yeah. is to convince men to just pee into urinal which they would usually do anyway. Well, especially in the, in the beginning phases now of, of, exactly. of your research. Yeah. yeah. So the idea is that at first we install them into male bathrooms in, say, a mall or at the University of Cape Town. 
And from there, we start small scale. Maybe we collect 100 liters of urine a day, we learn a lot about how the process would work, and then start recovering the valuable products from it. Okay. Yeah. It is something that I wanted to ask, uh, well, I'll, I'll comment on later on about the quantities. But before we do that, let's, let's get on to the actual the process, you know, yes. carry on with what we yeah, were talking about. Yeah, so let me about. explain how it actually works. The, the process we require to actually make the bi -brick. So it starts with the collected stabilized urine. So the first step is once the urine comes to the lab or the resource recovery facility, as we like to call it, mm -hmm. we have to filter the products. So essentially, once we filtered the stabilized urine, this is essentially the solid product that we have. So this is actually calcium phosphate. So yeah. it's a type of it fertilizer. It looks, looks like lime almost. Or... Well, it's a combination. Oh, okay. So it's residual lime because that's what we've added in there. And then it would also be all the phosphate. So essentially we remove about 97% of all the phosphorus found in urine. And yeah, this in essence is an inorganic fertilizer then, which we can sell and use. And use, yeah. It's not wasted. No, it's... exactly. Okay. And then, so once we filtered that, we have the liquid component. So this is the liquid component now. Before we start the biobrick process, we have to add our aggregate. So essentially what we do is we have, at the moment we're using gray waki, which is kind of like a gravel, right? Sure. So we but use- For those of you who don't know what an aggregate is, it's sand, stone, rocks, that type of thing. Yeah, They're just any... finer, more fine or coarse, that type of thing. Yeah. So that's what- and, and I mean, you could use waste material to replace this as well, you know, like from the building um, oh, yes. recovered, industry. Uh, recovered and crushed, recrushed exactly. material. From quarries and stuff like that. So any waste material you could potentially use. Okay. So we use 50% of this, and then we test it just as proof of concept using normal beach sands, so another 50%. Obviously, yeah. this is not sustainable. You don't want to go and yeah. use all our beach sand to produce this, but it was really just proof of concept. Okay. So this would be replaced with other waste material, essentially. How, how come you haven't tried using just building sand? Or, or yeah, clay. So, clay is kind of a wet thing. So, but yeah, I, I mean, the, the, there's so many things that we have to consider, so many variables. So at the moment, we're just starting with this. And actually, one okay. of my master's students is looking specifically at these different quantities to improve the strength of the bio brick. And, and hopefully so we're going to meet him yes, later on when he gets to the lab. I'm not sure. I'll... Yes, you will meet him and then you can chat to him about his project. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so, so, so we've got okay the aggregate, then there's other, well, obviously the brick. I mean, if you don't, that's the brick. <laughs> and then there's that other yellow yes, so, glass container there? So this is the stabilized urine. So this is the treated urine. And you'll see from the color that actually it's been treated. So it's not okay. the typical color of your urine that you would see. Also, it's if very you, pale. Yeah. This is very I pale mean, and very clear. And it's the other thing is, if you open here, yeah, it has no bad smell. No typical bad smell that you would associate with urine. Okay. I mean, you're welcome to smell it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's give it a... Yay! No, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what that smells like? It smells like fresh concrete. <laughs> it's, when a fresh concrete floor has been laid and it's... It's still green, so it's been curing for maybe five to seven days, and, and, and it's that raw concrete. That's what that smells like. I was I never thought of it like that. Yeah. Okay. You know, all all out in <laughs> they the open. They can't smell it, but yes. <laughs> True. Yes. But I did smell this earlier, and as soon as you open that, I've, I've smelt this before somewhere. That's what it smells like. It just dawned maybe, on me. Maybe maybe it's because of the calcium hydroxide, because that is used in the process for concrete and stuff like that. It's, so. Well, maybe it is. Yeah. But it absolutely does not stink or smell like. Urine, yeah, no, which yeah. is a bonus. Yeah, so that's actually been sitting there for probably close to a year, and it still doesn't have a bad smell. Please yeah. do not open the one <laughs> that has not been stabilized and has yeah, been so sitting for a year. If, if, we, if we didn't treat it, you would get a very strong ammonia smell. It's very pungent. Okay. It would hit you very hard, and it's actually probably quite bad for you to smell it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And that's, that's kind of what... We touched, I think we did touch on it earlier, where once the bricks are cured, they don't actually smell like anything. They well, initially they would smell, but I'll explain why they do. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. okay, so so, on, so now you have that treated urine, and essentially what you do, you house it in this container, and you take your aggregate and your sand, and you mix it with special bacteria. 
and you put it in a mold of any shape you want. So we chose a shape of a conventional brick. And essentially what you do is you feed the urea-rich solution that comes from the treated urine. And you pump it through the mold from the bottom up, and then what happens is the liquid would come out of this mold. And it's collected, right? Yes, not so essentially we would out. collect that liquid component. So that bottle is not shown here. Sure. And what happens, or the purpose of the bacteria, is a number of things. So the bacteria start degrading the urea that's found in the urine. Okay. And they degrade the urea into carbonate ions, and the byproduct is ammonium. Okay. But let's focus on the carbonate ions. The carbonate ions combine with the calcium that you would find in the urine. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned before, you have additional calcium because you've treated it with calcium hydroxide. Okay. But that's still not enough, so we add extra calcium by adding calcium chloride. We, and that calcium chloride, where did you get that from? Was that just... So that's a chemical that you would have to buy and you add it into the container, essentially. Okay, yeah, so that's the synthetic part, really, of yes, this process. Exactly, yeah. that's the only... Well, I guess the other synthetic part is the calcium hydroxide as well. Okay, yeah, yeah but, but I mean, that, that is the added bit to... Yeah. To, to improve the this. efficiency of the process. Sure, okay. So now you've got carbonate ions from the bacteria that help you degrade the urea and you've got the calcium. And so what happens is the calcium and the carbonate ions combine and form calcite or calcium carbonate. And that essentially glues all the sand particles together. Okay. And then the other purpose of the bacteria, it's kind of sad actually, the bacteria act like nucleation sites. Nucleation meaning they start the crystallization process. They start forming crystals of calcium carbonate, but around their bodies. So they and become the glue and everything exactly. sticks to them. And eventually, if you leave it long enough, they're going to be encapsulated within the bio brick. Okay. But we also feed them special food yeah. so that they can survive in these conditions. So when the process stops, so when you stop feeding them the solution, eventually they will die. Okay. So in this bio brick, it's kind of sad to think about, you have millions of dead little bacteria that help you produce the bio brick but sadly now are dead and yes. found in here. Okay. But, but I mean, you know, bacteria is, I mean, it is a living thing, which, yeah. is, which is one thing, but it's... But it's beneficial. It's beneficial using to it everybody, to, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Then the byproduct, so the byproduct that would come out from here is now rich in ammonium, as I said, and that ammonium now is responsible for the typical smell that you would have for urine. Okay. And so essentially what this process has done is it's delayed a natural process that would occur with urine. Yeah, sure. So if you pee into a container and you don't treat it, then naturally the urea is going to degrade and form ammonia and carbonate ions. Okay. So we delay that process and we force it to happen in, sure. in the mold. But then, but then it happens And then the afterwards. byproduct yeah. is that you have this ammonium. So that is the reaction, in other words. Exactly. It's taken place and it's... And so uh, when you first open the brick moulds, you're going to have a pungent ammonia smell. Because that's concentrated now, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. However, w the brick has to dry because you're sending a liquid through it. And yes. so when you leave the brick out for about a day or two, just at normal room temperature, all that ammonia quickly disappears because it's been exposed to the air. And that's and when so, it doesn't smell anymore. Exactly. After those two, so three this days, final whatever. brick here that you have will have no urine smell or no ammonia smell. Okay. But it doesn't end there. One of the things that we want to do with the ammonium is that the ammonia or the ammonium ions can be combined with sulfuric acid and produce ammonium sulfate. Now, ammonium okay. sulfate is another type of fertilizer. So it's, it's not wasted at all. It's, exactly. It's really just used. So we haven't investigated that, but other researchers have. So we know that it works, it's just a matter of combining the two things yes. together. But your, your main focus is, is not the fertilizer side for now, yeah. it is the, the bio bricks exactly. side. There, are, there yeah. are other people yeah. that so take care of the rest. We, we just, curiosity, we yeah. just wanted to know whether we could do it and we've shown that yes, that we it can. can. Be done. And now we're in the process of optimizing sure. it. And the end product is the brick? The end pro product is the brick. You also have a solid calcium phosphate fertilizer. Yes. And like I said, if you want to, you could also make another ammonium sulfate fertilizer. Okay. Now this brick is... Oh, I can pick it up, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. We've got to check. <laughs> um, I, I've 
felt not a lot of bricks in my life. Um, <laughs> it looks roughly about the same size as a normal stock brick, maybe just a little bit thinner yeah. than a stock brick. Uh, but I mean, it's it's a solid, you know, a little bit crumbly, but I'm sure this has been yeah, handled so, a lot. So uh, Shane, this was the first prototype. So what you'll see here is that on the edge here, the solid formation wasn't ideal. Okay. But if you look on the side here, it's perfectly smooth. Yes. And yeah. so now it's the formed, next perfectly. objective that we want is that the smoothness we want all around, all four corners. Okay. So that probably means that we have to rethink this mold because what's happening at the moment is that the liquid isn't getting to the corners. Okay. And when the liquid doesn't get to the corners, then you don't... It gets a bit crumbly. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, the, this thing doesn't smell at all. It's like, well, I guess it's quite old already. It's been yeah. curing over time, so, but not at all. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't see why you couldn't use that instead of your normal bricks. Yeah, so, so like I said, uh, a US-based company called Biomason mm -hmm. is literally doing just that. They have commercialized this process. They do use synthetic urea. And yeah, they are making something like 2,500 bricks a day using okay. a similar process. So look, on a big scale of things, right, 2,500 bricks a day is not a lot of bricks, but for the process that's being used, yeah. it shows potential, right? That oh, for sure. For so I, I think this is what we have to focus on. I mean, they, they've just been around for a few years. They've shown that it's commercially viable, and now it's just a matter of scaling it up. Okay, cool. So just off camera, yeah, we were going through the script so that I don't forget anything because I'm not the clever one here. Yeah? And uh, <laughs> Well, if, if you guys didn't pick it up, the bricks are safe to handle, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be touching them with our bare hands. <laughs> with no gloves either. With, yeah. Well, with no gloves. So um, uh, that answers that question. We'll move on from there. <laughs> Something that we talked about earlier, or, or what was mentioned earlier, is the quantity of urine that you've got to mm. collect. Now, again, from all of the research, one YouTube video that I watched, um, 20 to 30 liters of urine makes one yeah. brick, Yeah. which sounds like a lot. Yeah, so, so, so again, wow. Because it's just a feasibility study and proof of concept, that volume is substantial. But there's a number of things we have to consider. One, the 30 liters is really just to produce 1% of that forms the calcium carbonate. Which so from 30%, 1%. What is 1% of 30 liters? Would be 30 milliliters or 300? So, so it's on a mass basis. Okay. Yeah, so I think it equates to roughly about 330 grams of calcium carbonate. Okay. So that's all we need to make the, the actual bio brick. But the process itself, e, the efficiency of the urea, so at the moment we're only using between 30 to 40% of the urea. Okay. So meaning that for us to increase the strength and hence use less urine, mm -hmm. we need to improve that efficiency. And the challenge we have with the urine, which we didn't know at the beginning of this project, mm -hmm was, well, we knew this, but we didn't know it would affect it so drastically, is that the urine has a lot of other things in it, right? A lot of other salts dissolved in there. And it's called ionic strength. So just clump all those things together and we call it ionic strength. The ionic strength, though, drastically affects the ability of the bacteria to survive. Okay. Oh, and I mean, you so need the bacteria to survive too. To actually make the process yes. happen. Okay. So like I said to you, we add extra calcium chloride to improve the efficiency. That currently is our limitation. Okay, sure. Yeah. We need to add more calcium chloride to improve the efficiency of the process beyond 40%. Okay. But the challenge is when we add more calcium chloride, we increase the ionic strength. So it's a, and it's a so bit of a knock-on effect. And so the bacteria say, hell no, I'm not surviving at these conditions. And so that's where the process stops. Okay. So, you, but it's, it's, it's a balancing scale that you're working on now. Exactly. Now, if I'm correct, when I was walking through, well, when we were walking through earlier, uh, I was, of course, asking about everything in this lab. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just, my mind never does. stops. <laughs> <laughs> at this point, I started asking questions about all the other stuff I'd seen in the lab. And in fact, these were other experiments that were being conducted for separate research projects, which we are not actually allowed to talk about at the moment. So I had to cut them out. So there's two things that we're currently going to start within the next month investigating, is to see whether the bacteria, well, the preliminary results have shown that they, they can be adapted 
if you gradually increase the on end strength. Not just wham. Yeah. So sure they're not way. happy when you just dramatically increase it, then they all die. Okay, sure. But if you gradually increase it, they chill. They oh, grow okay. to the conditions of the new environment. Okay. And then it works so to our benefit. Well, your exactly. Benefit. So if that happens, then we can improve the strength. But we don't know to what extent that can happen. But you were saying that, uh, what is the other chap's name? Vuketa. Vuketa. He's going he's gonna to touch on the strength of... Uh, yes. So, so what you're talking about yeah, now. So right? when he talks about the strength, he essentially is just talking about changing the aggregate and stuff. Okay, yeah. not the actual not chemical... This, the other the more chemical. exciting thing, which I, well, I think this is exciting, is we're going to go prospecting for natural bacteria. Natural bacteria called uh, extremophiles. And like the name suggests... Are these like audiophiles, but they just no, go take it to an extreme? They, they, <laughs> they're special bacteria that live in extreme environments. Okay. And so we want to find bacteria that live in salt pans mm -hmm. that have very salty environments, so much like you would have for urine, but then that also produce the enzyme urease, which is responsible for degrading the urea. Okay. And if we can find the special bacteria, then in theory we could improve efficiency of the process by yes. using another strain of bacteria. Okay, but because, because of they are used to living in that salt exactly. environment. Yeah. So if they live in that salt, then we don't have to worry about the ionic strength, and then we can increase the efficiency even further. Yes. Okay. But yeah. I mean, it's a development process. So this is going to be years yeah. in the making, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, imagine. Yeah. We only started this work beginning of 2017. Okay. And did, yeah. you, uh, did you start it here at UCT? I started the biobrick work here at UCT. But you had previous but the experience. Urine, the urine treatment, if you like, and the process we were required yes. to make the biobrick was started in Switzerland, Switzerland in yeah. 2015. Okay. So, so when yeah. I was working in Switzerland at Eerbach, essentially I worked on a project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called Reinvent the Toilet Challenge. And the idea with that was, can we reinvent the toilet? Because it's something that's been around for a while, not many improvements not developed, have been yeah. made. And so the general essence was that the toilet must not be connected to a sewage line, shouldn't need uh, a power source, so you could use um, Well, you can use it in rural from, areas, basically, exactly. when there's nothing. And so, oh, and it should also recover value, so it must treat everything on site. Okay. And so the specific toilet design I worked on was focusing on source separation, meaning you're separating the feces and the urine. Yes. And my specific task was seeing what can we do with the urine? How can okay. we treat it? What can we make from it? And that's how I got into urine of all things. Oh, yeah. And it will, it's led you down the road yeah. too. Yeah, so I to mean, most of, the work we're doing, <laughs> most of the work we're doing is actually focusing on urine at the moment. Okay, cool. Yeah. Enter Vuketa, or at least I thought that was going to happen until we couldn't find him. Now, that is partly my fault. Uh, we said we were going to have him on to talk about his involvement in the BioBrick research project. And uh, I said to him, no, don't worry, dude. Uh, like 15, 20 minutes, we'll have you on and do a little bit of a talk. This is like an hour, an hour and a half later. Things are taking a little bit longer than I expected. And he actually had to go and continue with his research uh, with some other students. So we had to steal him away from that. Uh, luckily, we did get him back in time. And he's going to now talk about the strength or strengthening uh, of the bricks and the research thereof. Dylan was saying earlier that there are actually a couple of students working on this uh, biobrick project, but Vuketia, well, he was in the lab, so he's going to talk to us today, and specifically you're talking now about, or you're researching the strength of the bricks, is yes, that correct? Yes, yes, the strength. Okay, yeah. so <clears throat> tell us about uh, literally the strength of the bricks. I mean, a, a normal brick, uh, are these as strong as a normal brick, uh, you know, the floor's yours, really. Yeah. yeah, and that's the first question we usually get. People want to know, can we build with these bricks? How strong are they? How do they compare with bricks out there in the market? So I had to go do some research, and I found that the strength of bricks, normal clay bricks out there in the market, range from 3 to 12 MPA. So that's the range, and we're actually within that range with the bricks that we're making here, and we are at about 5 MPA, which is within the range. So 5 is good, but we don't think it's enough. I think we just can improve and increase the strength. And that's why I'm here doing my masters. I came back to, to pursue my studies further so that we can optimize the process and find other ways of, of, of um, growing these bricks. So one of the first things I looked into 
was the mixture of the sand and the grey waki aggregate. Because we found that having different portions of each actually affects the strength because it affects the porosity. So from literature we saw that we'd actually want to decrease the porosity as much as we can. Because if the porosity is um, less, then there's less space for the calcite to grow on. Well, easier for the calcite to grow because there's less spaces in between the, the, the particles. So um, after conducting a, a study, a porosity test study, I tested different uh, combinations and portions of the sand and grey waki. And we found that the optimum or the lowest porosity was having 75% sand and 25% of the grey waki. We initially were using 50% sand and 50% grey waki. And yeah, we're running tests at the moment to see um, the improvement in strength. Um, but from opening up the reactors and looking at the samples, it is promising that they are stronger than before. So part of my research is also to, 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 to grow these, not necessarily bricks. Right now, I'm actually growing core samples. They look like little columns. And the reason for the cylindrical shape is that it makes it much easier to test um, using the machines that we use to test concrete uh, in the lab here at GCT. And so something that I, that I wanted yeah. to ask, you, you said uh, a standard brick is what, uh, like 12 MPA, somewhere yeah, around there? 3 to 12 MPA. 3 to yeah. 12 MPA. Yeah. And, and your bricks now, what is the maximum strength or the most strength that you've got out of your current? 5 MPA. 5 MPA. Yeah. So still a bit of a way to go, right? Yes, really? yes, yes, definitely. Okay. But it's getting there. I mean, it's, that's yeah, the whole that's point of your research. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, what is that plastic thing? Over, there. Over here. So this is the mold that we use to grow the cylindrical cores uh, of um, the ones that I showed you over here. So this is from here. Uh, same way we set up this mold reactor. Mm. Fill it up with the sand and uh, mix it with the bacteria and pump the urine through and then the process begins and the cementation begins. and then. After four days, four to six days, you open it up and you got a solid. So also looking at um, decreasing the number of days as well for, for the growth of uh, these bricks. Cool. So Paquette is actually making sure that your guys' future houses don't fall down, right? Yes. <laughs> And Making lot, sure they are strong enough. A lot of people also ask if they smell and they don't smell at all. No, well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll probably, uh, probably cover that just now. It's, I think it's a question that I may have asked or I may be asking in the future. <laughs> uh, Vuketa, thanks very much for your, for your input. And uh, yeah, let's go back to Dr. Randall. Dylan, from everything that we've discussed here, where are we going? Uh, yeah. From here on, what is, what is the next step in, I don't know, using the... the Pro, not by, well, the byproduct really, or using the fertilizer. Is there anything else that we can use the urine for? Yeah. So I'm always asking myself that question. Always asking, what else can I make from the urine? And I think I call it the liquid gold, not just simply because it has that gold color, but also because it has so many valuable products that we can recover from it. Yeah. Not it's possibly stuff that you haven't even thought about yet. Exactly. That you're going to work on. Exactly. So. You know, at the moment we've just made calcium phosphate, but there's so many other fertilizers that we could potentially make from it. Okay. And so how would those processes look? Sure. You know, 95% of the urine is water. Could we recover the water in an efficient way, use it in, in drought areas such as Cape Town for alternative uses? Or who knows, maybe we could make energy from it. Sure. So there's this potential scope here for oh, yeah. a lot. This, this is going to keep me busy for many years, that's for sure. <laughs> now, uh, that leads me on to like, kind of a closing question, if you want to say. Uh, is there anybody else? Uh, I mean, you're, you're keeping everything in-house here at the University of Cape Town. Uh, am I in frame? Yeah, just about. <laughs> 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 Always got to keep that in mind. <laughs> External research, other universities from around the world, are they kind of chipping in here yeah. or are you doing this by yourself? Yeah, so the BioBrick process is purely a UCT thing at the moment, but we're always keen on collaborating with external parties. And there's lots of interest, as one could imagine. 
the former Swiss boss, so if I can say a big thank you to him, because okay. he's the one that got me interested in urine of all things. Sure, well, so, thanks man. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe say, so, don't say so thanks, his to, me. Name say thanks is to him. Though. Professor Kai Utrecht from um, ETH in Zurich and also IRVAC. And so he's the pioneer of this kind of work. I think he finished his PhD in 2002, 2003. And he's been working on urine ever since then. So it's a long time. It's a long time. Wow. And so, yeah, he's a world expert. And he got me interested in it. And I'm, I'm pretty sure probably from next year, this is going to be the sole focus of my research, is what else can we make from the urine? Okay. And I'm still working with him on some other interesting projects. And who knows where that's going to lead. Sure. They're still running the Reinvent the Toilet Challenge, so developing the toilet further. So there's always that room for further collaboration there. Okay. And if you know, anyone else in the world wants to work with us on this very exciting field, they just need to contact us. Well, that was actually the next thing I was going to ask, is if there is anybody else that, that sees this video, hopefully for the first time, <laughs> <laughs> or for many thousands of times afterwards, or they've just you know, been interested in the, in the field, yeah. how do they contact you? We're not going to give out any personal details here. Most definitely not. Yeah, so I, um, I think my, my contact details, if you just go to the University of Cape Town, it would be quite easy to find my contact details through that. <laughs> You've got an email address there uh, on the website. Uh, do you, yeah, do you yeah, recall yeah. what it is? My email address? You go and look at the website. <laughs> <laughs> so if you do want to get hold of uh, Dylan, uh, Dr. Randall actually, just Google. Google is excellent at finding things. Dr. Dylan Garth Randall. And look for the little UCT links, uh, University of Cape Town. The contact details are all there. I will leave certain links in the description below, so check those out uh, if there are any of you that are interested in joining the course. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to add, uh, you know, maybe that we haven't touched on, or yeah, I don't know, it's up to you. The floor's yours. Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I can't think of anything at the moment. <laughs> so that's it for today's video, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. If you liked it, please hit the thumbs up button. Uh, support. UCT support Dylan here uh, on a worldwide scale. We need to really develop this process and uh, everything that they are doing, we need to sustain our future. That's, I would say that's what we're Pretty doing. Pretty much, now. thank yeah. you. And uh, uh, thanks for the time again. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, I'm gonna try and bring you interesting videos like we have been over the last couple of videos, <laughs> really, and into the future. So please subscribe to my videos if you haven't subscribed already. And for those who regularly watch, Thank you very much. And uh, leave the comments in the comments section below. Uh, I would like to hear what you think about Dylan's research. And I'll pass any comments on to him. <laughs> <laughs> All the appropriate ones. <laughs> and uh, guys, we'll see you next time. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cool. Cheers. Bye.